Wilhelm Furtwängler succeeded Nikis as conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic in 1922 and personified that flexibility. Some musicians even found it hard to define his downbeat. With Furtwängler, precision in orchestral player was not his primary aim. Klemperer was not concerned with precision. If it happened, he liked it and accepted it. I often had the feeling that Furtwängler actually didn't want this. And his rather, we used to call it puppet on a string, uh, physical way of conducting, was in a way rather deliberate. He wanted to avoid the slick modern American whip-crack powerhouse chords. He wanted more weight, more almost heaviness. He wasn't a machine, but in his flexibility he was very precise. And it takes greater precision to be precise about a fluid shape than it does about a uh, solid shape. A solid shape you can specify. You can give it the angles you decide and the planes and the area, and you can be quite specific about that. It can be also very complicated, very complex. But to be precise about a living, moving fluid, that is, I think, really, that requires great skill. The 103 musicians of the unsurpassed Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, conducted by the renowned Dr. Furtwegler, rehearsed Brahms' fourth symphony for their concert that evening in the Empress Hall, Earl's Court. The Berlin Philharmonic was invited to Britain by the Dean of Oriel College, Oxford, leader of the movement called Christian Action, as a gesture of reconciliation.
has been criticized for imprecision. The criticism is justified, but the evaluation isn't. Which is to say that where Furtwängler was imprecise, he not only wanted to be, but the composer wanted him to be. Let me give you one example. First, a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony under Toscanini. I wasn't there myself, but I gather that as soon as the introductory bars, Furtwängler, who was there, jumped up from his seat, shouted bloody time beater, and left the concert hall. What had happened, what had aroused him so, was that Toscanini took the opening sextuplets very precisely, so that you could hear them as sextuplets. Now comes the other part of the story, and that is Furtwinger's own performance of the opening of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. There you couldn't hear a thing. You certainly couldn't hear sextuplets. What you could hear was a vague, tense noise. The beginning before the beginning, as it were, which is exactly what Beethoven had intended it to be. This polarity between two different basic approaches driven precision or searching flexibility is a major fascination in the study of conducting. Debate still rages over who was right, Furtwängler or Toscanini. Toscanini was example, which like my teacher said, is objective conductor, who after romantic time may, came back, follow very much the score. And let's, his Beethoven was very objective, you know. Is no ritenuto, no ritenuto. If it's crescendo, it's crescendo. Very, very, really with great spirit, how he was, of course, very objective. Then Furtwängler, as opposite, he was more subjective and more individual. And he could make, you know, some rubatos and different in, 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 um, in, uh, in, in tempis, and sometimes he gets so fast, crazy tempos, something too slowly, if the, but it was always very interesting. But there was no doubt about it. The precision of Toscanini could be just as effective as the flexibility of Furtwängler. Either rehearsed or worked or looked or never. The whole day just music. And that was for me incredibly important. Because until then, I was a little bit of a coffee house boy from Budapest.
In the late 30s, Toscanini and many other European conductors faced a critical turning point in their lives. With storm clouds hanging over Europe, the hand of opportunity beckoned from across the ocean. Seemingly far from danger, America was a land where a host of new musical possibilities was waiting to be explored. Most of the great European conductors were about to become great American conductors. had no interest in the technical side of recording and um, Toscanini always just expected to hear on the finished product what he heard standing in front of the orchestra and of course in those early days that wasn't always possible because of the limitations of his huge dynamic range we were recording once one of the Respighi tone poems and when he came up to listen to it he felt the climaxes weren't loud enough and the engineer said, <clears throat> but Maestro, if we make it any louder, it will break the equipment. And he said, break the equipment then. <laughs> artist does thousands of things for which we have no method of writing on paper. We don't know how to do that. Uh, and we, we have to, through imagination, through feeling, through, I don't know what, some instinctive quality that some artists have, uh, we have to try to understand and reproduce and give to the listening public what we consider was in the eye, mind, and soul of the composer.
Leopold Stokowski was born in London, but managed to acquire an accent of indeterminate origin. It was all part of a natural showmanship, which from time to time obscured the full extent of his talent. In fact, he was an expert conductor who could draw from any orchestra what became known as the Stokowski sound, that rich, lush quality developed during his 20 years with the Philadelphia Orchestra. He compelled people to watch him because virtually not one, not a question of not one bar is in the same tempo from the next bar, but there's not one beat is in the same tempo. And to stay together, the orchestra had to be hanging on that finger <laughs> or, or that, that hand, um, like, a, like a somebody uh, trying to climb a mountain. Um, with the orchestra with him that way, he was able to control in incredibly small things within beats. It, people always say that Stokowski had very vague gestures. They weren't vague at all. Von looks very carefully. He gives, although it's a very expansive, um, it, it, there's a very small and controlled beat usually, and big dynamics are indicated within, with, you'd have to be an idiot not to see what he wanted. But then it's what, it's what he does with tempo that's extraordinary, and that's where the control comes in. You can only do that, I think, if the player isn't worrying about, well, I have to be at this point of the bow, bow going up. Stokowski just said, okay, you play where it's comfortable for you. The flute has a solo. Instead of my conducting him, I follow him. I, I, I notice how he likes to phrase. Same with the oboe, the clarinet, or the horn, or whatever is a solo instrument. Now, with the strings, uh, I like the feeling of the violin that sounds like a voice singing, to give it what we call cantabile in, in music. Uh, this singing quality is a beautiful thing. You have to give them a little freedom and breadth to do that, and uh, I admit I do that. <laughs> The visually dramatic sweeping gestures he used to achieve that sense of freedom and breadth were perfect for the romantic visions of Hollywood. Stokey loved being famous, and he wasn't at all shy about using Hollywood as a means to enhance that fame. A lot of people still today look upon him as a charlatan, but he was a musician right through and through, and he knew exactly how to present himself to the world. But when it came to conducting, I still think there was no one before him or since who knew how to make an orchestra sound. You might not have agreed with the sound. It was terribly lush and sometimes perverse, but it certainly ravished your ear. It wasn't charlatanry. He really did believe in it. He believed that the huge sort of Victorian organ sounds that he got in the Bach, uh, the, the Toccata and Fugue uh, were justified. And when you listen to it, it's a terribly exciting sound. Mm -hmm. 